Uh, good morning and welcome to our first webinar for 2020. On behalf of the Brentist Foundation, I am Ray Hartley and this webinar is co-hosted by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. This is the first of a three-part series on the economy hosted by Professor Harun Borat. Uh, Harun is a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council and Professor of Economics and Director of the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. And joining him is Michael Sachs, a Joint Professor of Economics at WITS, and the former head, I think, as everybody knows, of the National Treasury's Budget Office. And uh, the topic of today's uh, webinar is our fiscal consolidation path. Is it feasible? And it's the first of a three-part series, which Arun will, will tell you about. And without further ado, over to you, Arun. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, and in particular, thanks very much to our electronic audience. I know it's uh, tough on a Friday as it is, but even harder to start the year this early with uh, uh, some, some really tough uh, questions around the economy. Um, let me just give you a quick sense as a, as a background to the seminar series. Yes, it is uh, an event that's happening today, but it's really part one of three seminars that we thought we would, we would hold through the Brenthurst Foundation um, around how to think about our macroeconomic uh, crisis, let's call it that. And in essence, the three-part series is built around the notion that, um, um, firstly, we need to understand the evolution of our macroeconomic crisis, if you like, or our, our fiscal debt position. Um, which, as, I, as I'll talk a little bit later about, Michael will get to. But the second part of the seminar series, if you look carefully, is really about trying to say, well, you know, a lot of, um, if you like, the, the mirror image of expenditure is uh, financing. And so revenue management is really critical. And that's what seminar two will do. The third part is to say, well, if you have insufficient revenue and you have high debt levels, perhaps you should spend better. And so there's a very clear focus in the third seminar on efficiency of spending. But um, I think we, we, we should be honored, actually, in many ways to have uh, our speaker, um, uh, Michael Sachs, coming in. And he's uh, adjunct professor at the moment, uh, M Michael Sachs, uh, talking to us and giving us a really, really clear background to our macroeconomic uh, challenges. So just before I hand over to Michael, let's just remind ourselves, he's worked for over 25 years in public policy, politics, and government in South Africa. He's the former head of the National Treasury's Budget Office. So in that way, he has been in the war room. Um, prior to that, he spent nine years at the national headquarters of the ANC, where he coordinated economic policy and led the re party's research agenda. And Michael holds an MSc in economics from the University of London, SOAS, and a master's in uh, public admin from Harvard uh, University's Kennedy School. So I think we're really honored. And what I'm going to do is hand over, uh, sorry, I should have also said um, that you would have noticed in the flyer that um, Michael was going to be joined by Tabi Liorca, but as is a very sad sign of the times, Tabi has contracted um, COVID. Um, and so she's busy sort of convalescing. And so our thoughts and prayers go out to, to, to Tabi. Um, but let me hand over to Michael, and he's going to take us through his presentation. Over to you, Michael. Unmute, Michael. And so uh, 2021 begins uh, as we unmute um, uh, thank you very much, Haroon and Ray, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to go quite quickly through the presentation slides, um, and we can maybe come back, because I, I, I suppose what I'm going to try and do is, is set a, a kind of macro background picture of the fiscal crisis we're in now. Um, Sorry, let me just get these controls. So there's three elements in the presentation. The first is to just look at the patterns of growth since 1994 as a context for understanding the, the fiscal challenges that we face today. The second uh, is to look at what fiscal choices did South Africa make 
in the context of those patterns. So as growth was rising and falling, what kind of choices did we make about our fiscal and budget commitments? And then lastly, to look at why the path ahead of fiscal consolidation, in my view, is extremely challenging uh, and perhaps even impossible to achieve. Um, uh, so, so let me go straight into the first part, which is the growth landscape uh, over the last uh, 30 years, let me say. So I think uh, it's important to locate our fiscal challenge in the transition to democracy and in the understanding that uh, as we were transitioning into democracy, of course, there was a lot of debate about how are we going to pay for the RDP? And to many people's surprise, uh, in the years following democracy, we had quite a con we, we, government acted to, to stabilize its debt position. And it did so in a period there between 1994 and 2000, where growth did uh, improve on the back of the transition to democracy, but perhaps not as much as we had hoped. So I'm essentially here with these averages showing you three uh, core periods of growth. The first in that 1994 to 2000, and that's when we were implementing our gear policy. And then there was a sense between 2000 and 2008 that we had succeeded in stabilizing our macro fiscal position. And that finally the dividend of democracy uh, was coming to, to bear. We'd set up these world-class institutions. We had good macro policy and therefore uh, we, we were uh, rewarded for that good behavior with growth. And we had this high growth rate averaging above 4% uh, over that period. And towards the end of the period, uh, touching 5 and and even looking like it could go to 6%. Then, of course, you have the global crisis and uh, a, a rebound from the global crisis, which I think is, is quite significant, because uh, it created a sense from 2000 to 2008, and also into that rebound, it created a sense that this was now a new normal. And it was uh, reasonable to expect that South Africa would grow at 4%, 4.5%. And, and in that context, we drafted a national development plan which set a target of 6%. And it seems uh, perhaps uh, ridiculous now looking back, the 6%. But at the time, it was not. Uh, it, it seemed like a new normal, and, and that the logic was we just had to do a few structural reforms, and we would uh, achieve this 6% target. But of course, this is not what happened. And instead of uh, our hopes of stepping up another step in, in those averages, we actually stepped down, and growth has been decelerating uh, ever since. So... <laughs> One interpretation of this uh, pattern is that uh, South Africa messed itself up, shot itself in the foot. As I said, we had good macro policy, we had world-class institutions, we were rewarded with a high rate of economic growth. And this chart is showing the, the uh, South Africa's growth rate, not going back to 94, but now to 2000, the last 20 years. And you can see our growth was very strongly aligned with the global, the world average, which is the black line, before the global crisis. But after the global crisis of 2009, we have a divergence between South Africa and the world average. So the narrative that goes along with that is the narrative of state capture, increasing uh, poorly uh, executed macroeconomic policy, including fiscal policy, et cetera, as the core driver of this divergence from, from, from the global average. I disagree fundamentally with that analysis because uh, I think certainly there are things that South Africa did that were, that, that were wrong and South Africa's own uh, uh, mistakes played into the deceleration. There's no doubt about it. But if you, I now add another line to this chart, which is the, the average growth rate of economies like, other economies like South Africa, and that is non-fuel commodity exporters. In other words, countries in mainly in Latin America and Africa that have a similar export basket, basket to South Africa. You see that South Africa's pattern of growth is not unusual at all. In fact, one could say we perform slightly better. And I think there's a, a growing realization, or there was prior to COVID, 
that uh, a range of countries, uh, including Brazil and Chile and Colombia and many African countries, saw a sustained deceleration in their growth uh, in this period. So, as I say, uh, I think that the conclusion that we had good policies and we performed well, and then we had bad policies and we performed badly, is far too simplistic. Um, so throughout our history, and it's a very well-established uh, idea in the economic literature, that the business cycle of developing countries, unlike the, 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 the advanced economies where you have a kind of endogenous business cycle driven by developments in the labor market, developing country business cycles are very much driven by terms of trade shocks. And this is essentially what happened. You had a not the, the real shock for, for us was not 2009, it was 2011. What happened in 2011 is that China began to decelerate. South Africa is not as directly dependent on commodities as many other countries. For instance, uh, the revenue we collect from the mining sector is very small. But it has a very large indirect impact. For example, a lot of our non-commodity exports, the fastest growth in our non-commodity exports, are to other African countries. And those other African countries are themselves dependent on commodities. Secondly, a lot of our growth has been driven by finance. And there's been a very strong relationship between financial conditions and the dollar in particular, but financial conditions in general, and the commodity cycle. So all of these things impact on South Africa. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that uh, these uh, global cycles uh, will continue. And in my view, uh, the big mistake we made uh, was to, to not realize the extent to which our growth in that period was driven by the commodity cycle. And because we didn't realize this, we acted in a particular way. We acted on the assumption that we're in a new paradigm, we're democratic, we've got world-class institutions, we've got excellent policy, and that all means we're gonna grow fast. And what did we do? The first thing we do, we did, was to significant, significantly lower taxes. So over this cycle of global growth, we have had a pro-cyclical tax policy. And uh, this graph attempts to, to capture part of that by showing uh, what happened with personal income tax, which is the, the single largest uh, tax instrument that we have. So the, there's a, unfortunately, I can't uh, point for you at these lines, but the little uh, dotted line shows the average personal income tax rate. And you read it off the right hand side. So you, you have different brackets with different rates. But this is just the average rate to give you a sense. And you can see there, but between 99 and 2002, we significantly lowered tax rates. But even more than that, we gave taxpayers massive relief uh, by using bracket creep. So the, the, the black line shows the, the average adjustments to the brackets that were announced in successive budgets by the Minister of Finance. And the important thing is to compare that to consumer inflation, because if your salary increases in line with consumer inflation, which most salaries do, plus a percentage point or two, um, it means uh, if, if the bracket is growing faster than inflation, your salary increase won't take you into a higher bracket because the bracket has been moved faster than your salary increase. And you can see these huge, uh, um, um, generous relief given to taxpayers in the period of rapid economic growth. And unfortunately, then when we go into the period of deceleration, we do exactly the opposite. We begin to uh, raise the brackets uh, slower than uh, compensation. So now the, the fiscus is benefiting from when you get a wage increase in line with CPI, part of that, a large part of that is going to, to, to the fiscus. And of course, this method of raising taxation through inflation, essentially, is extremely regressive because if most of your income, the top bracket is about 1.5 million. If you earn a lot more than 1.5 million, then the brackets have no impact on your tax bill. 
But if you're below 1.5 million, then where you fall in the brackets makes a massive difference to the tax bill you pay. So this is not only inefficient in the sense that it is hidden, but it is also highly regressive uh, way of raising tax. So the point I'm making here, and I mean, this is PIT. If you look at corporate income tax was also lowered significantly between 1994 and 2000, you had a general um, uh, pattern of lowering tax during the upswing. And then we were forced to pay for that sin by raising taxes during the downswing. And you see there that then PIT rates rise again. And ideally, what you would want with tax policy is to keep a flat rate across the business cycle. So just a little bit more on taxation. The, um, initially, there was a very strange development that as uh, uh, the economy was decelerating year after year from around 2011, 2012, 2013, personal income tax was extremely buoyant. So growth was declining. Uh, um, and nominal growth inflation was also declining. But the receipts that the, the, the fiscus was getting from personal income taxation surged ahead massively in those years between 2011 and 2013. And you can see that in quite a pronounced fashion in that graph that the, the and I wish I could point to it, but you can see the line, the trajectory of the personal income tax line is really uh, accelerating until about 2015, and then it goes along a more normal pace of uh, increase. And this really explains, uh, and this is another um, aspect of my argument against the idea that the, 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 core, the, the center of all of our fiscal problems relies in state capture. Really what happened is not that a new SARS commissioner was appointed and suddenly tax uh, revenue collapsed, what happened is that you had inexplicably buoyant taxation prior to 2016. And uh, so tax was growing in a way that was nobody really understood. And we couldn't explain it. Even in Treasury, we didn't understand why year after year we were getting more tax than we had predicted. And that came to an end in 2016. Why did it come to an end? One of the reasons, I believe, is that the driver of that increase in, in uh, tax buoyancy, particularly personal income tax, was um, uh, even though the economy was decelerating, finance and other sectors of the economy continued to boom on the back of low interest rates in the global north and continued to contribute to very high uh, um, uh, salary increases at the top end of the distribution. Remember, in the labor market, most workers don't pay personal income tax. So you can have growing unemployment and uh, job losses and uh, poor performance of uh, salaries at the bottom end. But as long as the affluent, the top 10% of the population are getting a boom in their income, uh, you will get good tax receipts. And there's evidence to suggest that the Gini coefficient in labor market earnings massively increased in that period. Uh, and that increase came to an end around 2015, 2016. Also around 2015, 16, there are a bunch of other economic, underlying economic factors. Growth decelerated even further in that period, bringing to an end this tax boom. Before I uh, um, carry on uh, from this slide, just to say that the other aspect of the tax system, as you can see there, is that taxes on capital, wealth, and corporate income are naturally uh, pro-cyclical. So they naturally are relieved, those taxes, when the economy performs badly. And the first, the thing that we resorted to, as well as re using uh, bracket creep, which is highly regressive, the other thing we did is to rely increasingly on consumption taxes to, to underpin the fiscus, which are also the most regressive taxes. Of course, we raised that but much more significantly were were year on year very large increases in the fuel levy that and and so consumption taxes which are the most regressive taxes really dominate our our so while we have a generally progressive tax structure um, our response on the tax side one could say was shifting the burden of the fiscal consolidation uh, off the the shoulders of the affluent 
Now, if I move to the spending side and see what we did. Now, this green line, it's a, it's a percent of GDP, and it's showing core expenditure. Core expenditure means I've excluded essentially interest payments, and I've excluded uh, what is called in the fiscal accounts payments for financial assets, which is essentially bailouts for, for state-owned companies. So it's a, it's a narrow definition of expenditure. It's the expenditure that is under the control, the direct control of the budget authorities. And you can see that between 2000 and 2010, exactly in the period where we were having this commodity group boom and growth was so strong, we saw a huge level shift in expenditure. Expenditure increased from below 20% of GDP to around 26% of GDP. Now, again, it's important to locate this in the transition to democracy, that uh, the transition to democracy required there was a dividend and the dividend had to be felt by the poor and by those who depend largely on public services. And this increase in spending between 2000 and, and, and 2010 or 2012 was not, it was very well planned, very well targeted, very well executed. It had four elements. The one was a very large expansion of health, education, and policing services, which I'm going to come back to in the next slide. The second were very large improvements in the remuneration of public servants. And I'm going to make the point that really the large increases in the remuneration of public servants took place in that period between 2000 and, and 2012. The third was a large increase in transfers, cash transfers, in two forms. One was uh, social grants going to, to the poorest, and the other was uh, transfers to local government to support free basic water and electricity for the poorest. And the last element of that expansion was a surge of infrastructure spending that started around 2006, 2007, and reached its peak at the time of the World Cup, but really continued. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that we have two periods of expenditure growth again. The one is very rapid expenditure increases between 2000 and 2010 20 to 2012, coinciding with the global boom, coinciding with South Africa's accelerated growth. And then we have a period of fiscal containment and fiscal constraint, such that this, uh, at least by this number, uh, public spending did not increase between uh, 2012 and around 2016 for, for five or six years. And then the increase after 2016 is really three factors. The first is uh, free uh, tertiary education, free university education. The second is um, uh, um, payments around national health insurance and, and increased capacity in the health sector, but targeted at particular uh, vertical interventions in the health, health sector. And the third is simply the collapse of GDP. So increasingly from, 2019, from 2016, you see GDP, which is the denominator of this number, uh, falling, leading to this increase. So, so the idea that you had runaway expenditure under the Zuma administration is, in my view, wrong. What you had is a conscious choice made in the course of a commodity boom to increase social provision to the poorest South Africans, followed by a deceleration of growth. And the, the crime, the fiscal crime, if there is one, was not that the Zuma administration or the last decade of, of government uh, uh, had runaway expenditure. The failure was to decrease expenditure uh, over that period. What was being, what government was being called to do in that period was significantly decrease expenditure. And we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question in South Africa. We have a constitution that says there shall be a rising floor of social and economic rights. And we can talk about corruption and inefficiency and all of these things. And in the latest seminars, we certainly will. And there's, there's a lot to be said about uh, uh, improving the quality of expenditure. But at a fundamental fiscal level, these kind of uh, magnitudes that are shown on this graph are not reflecting that. They're reflecting a choice to expand service delivery to the poorest 
followed by 10 years of really harsh fiscal constraint. And I want to make the argument that during the last 10 years, that fiscal constraint has been felt as austerity by those who depend on public services, which is over overwhelmingly the bottom 50% of the population, African people in particular. So just to underscore this, and I won't go into this in, in, in much detail, but let's just take the police. This table shows that in 2002, there were 130,000 police officers or employees of the police department, um, the ministry. That was increased to almost 200,000. The force numbers increased massively over that period. This was not an accident. It was a very deliberate choice, and it was a choice backed by research and the, 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 the public discourse at the time, which said that crime was a major impediment to growth in South Africa. If you remember, cast your mind back to that 2000 period. That was one of the major issues. So a conscious choice was made to expand the police force. And if you look at that line that says population per employee, that is telling you the real size of the police force, that how many uh, citizens is each police officer responsible for, if you think, if, if you like. So in 2002, it was around 286 citizens. That fell to 209. So the police force expanded massively. Of course, their salaries improved, and the police's salaries improved uh, in this data by about 2.1% in real terms per annum. That pales into insignificance compared to the health sector, where you see uh, uh, compensation increasing by about 5% in real terms per annum. Uh, uh, for, for health workers. But you see the pattern across these core departments. Now, these core departments, health, education, and, and policing, account for about 50% of the budget, but they account for 70% or 75% of compensation spending. People often make a mistake and think that it's kind of bureaucrats. When we talk about compensation, we're talking about bureaucrats in Pretoria. Bureaucrats in Pretoria are a very small and insignificant component of the compensation budget. What the compensation, 70% of the compensation budget is police officers, nurses, and teachers. And that's before we start even talking, that's 70%. Then you have to add to that uh, the defense force, uh, home affairs, and a bunch of other critical services, the criminal justice sector, etc. Now, if I look at the pattern from since 2012, again, let's look at the police force. Uh, in that line there, the employees of the police department have fallen quite significantly in that period. The same has happened in, well, uh, the employees of the health department have increased and education have increased, but the number of citizens served by those departments have increased. In other words, objectively, the real value of services, because if you want to value what is education provision, it's really the class size in the public sector. So class sizes have been increasing over the last decade as a result of fiscal constraint. Salaries have also been increasing. But if you see in that last column, the compensation spending per employee has been increasing in real terms over the last, well, between 2012 and 2018, in the health sector by 2.4%, in education by 2%, and in policing by 2.3%. That's an important increase, uh, CPI plus 2%. It pales into insignificance, one should add, compared to the increase in compensation experienced by affluent South Africans at the top end of the distribution. Uh, one might say that it's a kind of ordinary, normal increase in compensation um, of course, as we'll discuss in later seminars, the real issue is the quality of what are we getting for that spending. But the point I'm making here is that compensation increased as a result of explicit choices that were made in 2007. And uh, since 2012, it's been increasing, but not at uh, unreasonable rates. Um, let me find my next button. Okay, and I'll, I'll skip this, but just to say on this slide, you see the for as as uh, um, uh, government increasingly scrambles to contain expenditure, and you see here that compensation budgets are quite well contained. The thing that takes the biggest knock is capital budgets. 
Also, you can see here that goods and services budgets today are below what they were in terms of share of GDP, what they were uh, uh, 10 years ago. So what the way I characterize this period is that we have austerity without consolidation. Austerity because the real value of public services has been declining, but we've not been able to close the deficit. I seem to have somebody drilling in my building. I hope it's not going to disturb me too much. Um, so, so, of course, the thing that the, the actual deficit is the, the difference between that dotted line, which is expenditure plus interest payments, and interest payments have been increasing much faster than revenues increased. Uh, and so the overall deficit, we didn't consolidate the deficit, and we're left with now this before the COVID crisis, a structural imbalance in the public finances, a massive gap between spending and revenue that is driven to a large extent by um, uh, interest payments. And South Africa, I'll return to that just now, has one of the highest interest rates in the world. When, uh, and, and when I say that, I'm not talking about the repo rate or the short-term interest rate. Or, I'm talking about the rate at which government borrows. We're one of the uh, highest, uh, um, the sovereign, even before we entered into this fiscal crisis, we've always had a very high uh, sovereign uh, interest rate. So lastly, and, and without uh, um, spending too much time, we need to question how we move forward from this situation. And I just have two slides here. The first is showing the relationship between interest rates and economic growth. One of the reasons why there's been this huge shift in the consensus in the global north around fiscal austerity has been that interest rates are below growth rates. And when interest rates are below growth rates, uh, debt tends to stabilize, even if you expand the spending. And so if you read the documents coming out of the IMF and the OECD and all of these countries that are kind of setting a new uh, a view about austerity, they all say spend more because interest rates are lower than growth rates and they're likely to remain so for the next period, for the period ahead. And that's almost like a free lunch for the sovereign because the debt to GDP ratio is driven by these two factors. Now, in South Africa, uh, the black line is the bond yield. And you can see since 1985, it has consistently declined. And particularly during the after the transition to democracy and during the subsequent commodity boom. And, and this is the problem is that these commodity booms tend to go together with easier financial financing conditions for, for commodity exporters. The bond yield declined rapidly and then uh, stabilized uh, uh, around uh, 2009, uh, but has begun to, as our, as our sovereign has become increasingly, our sovereign position has become increasingly powerless, it's begun to increase. But the real problem that we have is that our growth rate has just gone down and down and down and down. And that is that there is nominal growth. And you can see now that our, the interest rates we face, however you measure them, are far, far higher than the growth rate. And there's a move in Europe to rethink about fiscal rules as uh, targeting uh, what is the fiscal balance that is politically feasible to, to achieve, because achieving a fiscal balance is a political objective, uh, because it depends on taxation and spending, and those are political choices. But this relationship between uh, interest rates and growth for a given balance, if your, your growth falls below your interest rates, then you require an even bigger budget surplus to stabilize the debt. And at what point does the surplus become unattainable because this growth rate is so far below? So that's my first point about the consolidation, is that it's going to be extremely challenging to have a fiscal consolidation. In fact, I would say it's, un, it's unlikely to occur in the absence of an acceleration of growth. 
And what we are likely to be doing is actually feeding into slower growth if we go too aggressive on the consolidation. The last slide just underscores this point. What I'm showing here is the growth rate, the simple growth rate, the nominal growth rate of expenditure of that same core expenditure compared to CPI. You can see the same pattern I spoke about earlier of during the, the period where we had good policies and good institutions. We had extremely rapid expenditure growth, far, far ahead of inflation. That was brought to heel from 2012 as the economy started to decelerate and over that 10-year period, you had a very small gap between nominal increases in expenditure and inflation. But what is being proposed by the Treasury, by the Minister of Finance now, uh, which is the stuff after the dotted line, and because of the length of this time series, it looks small, but it's three years of expenditure growth at a level that South Africa has never achieved in its history. So this would be the largest... Uh, contraction in government expenditure in the history of the country. And one has to ask, so we, we've never seen negative nominal, that's negative nominal growth, which is slated for next year, for 2021 fiscal year, followed by two years of essentially zero growth in expenditure. And the outlook beyond that suggests that in order to really stabilize debt, and if growth doesn't return at the kind of optimistic uh, uh, direction that we're hoping for, we're saying that in order to achieve debt stabilization, we would need a permanent austerity. And again, we need to ask, uh, how do we square that with South Africa's political settlement? Because there's corruption, there's inefficiency, but there is also dependence on public services by the vast majority of the population. I don't have a solution to this conundrum. I hope by the end of the third seminar, uh, maybe we'll get there. So thank you very much, and, and uh, let's Great. talk. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, um, uh, it's an incredible, incredibly rich presentation. Lots of data, lots of questions. Um, perhaps as the audience are thinking of um, pertinent questions, let me, let me just kick off with sort of a big picture question, Michael, and perhaps a little bit of a challenge to you. So you showed us the low growth numbers, right, and, and, and concluded that if you compared us to sort of, uh, I think it was commodity exporters, you know, the, the growth trajectory was very similar to, to those other economies. I want to challenge that, right? I mean, to some extent, if you look at the middle income country sample, so if you take a different sample of comparative economies uh, and over a long period and even exclude China, our growth performance has been abysmal, right? I mean, it's been about... You know, depending on the time period, anywhere between 1% and 2%. Um, in some cases, if you go back to the 80s, we've, we've flatlined. We've growth, grown at less than 1%. So that's my first question is, should we be elevating the discussion about which uh, macro debt um, or, or the debt position to uh, a more detailed discussion about growth policy and, and um, the, the dynamics around how to encourage and kickstart growth? Then linked to that, my... Second question is, you sort of got to it, but I, but I, but I worry that we, we – so if you look at your employment and wage numbers, right, I, I looked at – we can, we can pull up those slides again. I saw that what was happening is that wages were growing faster than, um, than employment was growing. So effectively, wages were leading employment. So I understand, yes – there's a very specific policy response with respect to health, education, and police, and we can all agree to that, uh, putting efficiency questions aside for now. Um, but clearly, wages were leading employment. So what you had was a fast-expanding wage bill. And, and effectively, if you look at the fiscus, you've got something like, and it's your numbers, Michael, 80% of all expenditure from the state goes to interest payments, the wage bill, transfers, and when you include procurement, you've got something like 2% left for investment expenditure. So I guess that's my question, really. So you've got a, almost an understated growth challenge, uh, I thought, combined with very little fiscus, fiscal space for investment expenditure. Surely something has to give. I mean, if, we, if we're going to maintain um, um, some semblance, not of the consolidation path the Treasury has outlined, but some semblance of, um, 
of credibility in debt markets. Let me, let me hand that over to you, Michael, and then as you're answering, I'll consolidate some of the other questions um, that are coming up. Thanks. So, uh, yes, uh, all of those are very pertinent. I think on the growth question, I, I mean, South Africa has, first of all, my argument is that we, we, if you look at the average of like countries, and it's possible to have different groups, the group I've chosen is uh, countries with a similar uh, export basket to us. And in my view, those are countries with a similar social and economic structure, particularly Latin American countries. If you look at those countries, we ha there hasn't been this massive divergence from the average. We have performed on average. Uh, should we be happy with that? No. Does that mean we don't need to discuss growth? No. Uh, we do need to grow, discuss growth, and I'm sure there are many countries that are higher than the average and have performed better than the average, and that's what we should be striving for. But the point is, from a fiscal point of view, that these long waves of uh, global terms of trade shocks are a reality that an economy like South Africa faces. And even if we'd had and sustained really great institutions and we had great growth policy, we would have still had to adjust downwards to the weaker global conditions that took place once China started decelerating. So even within that envelope of growth, even if we were performing above average, essentially the fiscal story is that we uh, um, probably expanded too much in the, 19, in the 2000s. And then we were unable to lower because the implication of the lower growth meant that we had to adjust downward our fiscal position. It would have been a better if we hadn't adjusted upwards so much in the first place. This is not a question of blaming a certain generation or a certain administration or something. This is a normal and very common problem that you get in developing countries. It's very difficult. And at the time, Treasury was fighting to run a bigger budget surplus. It's very difficult to run a budget surplus when you have high unemployment and poverty and a lot of call on your demand. So this is a political economy problem that is very typical and normal in developing countries that you have a terms of trade induced uh, increase in growth. You then raise your permanent commitments by employing more people and raising their salaries. And then you face the world changes and, and growth decelerates and you're unable to, to shift things down again. So we need to think about that going forward. You're absolutely right that, um, you know, Treasury controls the overall ceiling of expenditure, but it doesn't control much about what goes under that expenditure. And one of the things it doesn't control, essentially, is the public sector wage agreements. So uh, although I would say a CPI plus 2% average wage increase for the last decade is not out of order, but nevertheless, it was completely inconsistent with the budget that Treasury was putting on the table. So Treasury was trying to consolidate the fiscus and its budget ceiling was inconsistent with the, the, the CPI plus 2% wage increases. And the consequences of that was that departments are, are left with, uh, uh, or managers across the public service. And remember, there's no central control. There are like 250 employers in the public service. Each one of them has to make a call. I haven't got enough budget to pay the salaries that have been agreed. What do I do? And what you do is, is, is you stop hiring. And as a consequence, headcounts have been forced down while wages have been growing. And this has to be, uh, in my view, one of the solutions, the, the, the way we need to think about this, the solutions is what kind of a social compact can we have with labor in the public service that puts that kind of trade-off on, on the table in an in a, in a open and honest fashion? The one of investment, I would just say, you know, uh, there's a sense in which I find this, the, the, this investment argument um, um, wrong because all what government did for better or for worse in the 19 uh, uh, in the 1980s and the did responsibility from investment off the budget 
So the budget is not really, the budget doesn't pay for investment. Investment is about ESCOM, Transnet, some uh, entities that are funded from the budget, like uh, Sunral and Prasa. And in the case of uh, a Prasa, for instance, it's got very little to do with that, with, with budget allocations being insufficient. Prasa has been given 100 billion rand in the last decade just for capital, leaving aside the, 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 the operating expenditures. So, so the, the, I don't think there's a budget allocation. I don't think the central challenge of infrastructure investment is one of budget allocation. I think that it's a big problem, but it's a different problem. Great, Michael. I mean, those are, again, rich answers. I, I'm going to try and consolidate some of the questions, Michael, um, which you can see as well. So feel free to sort of um, answer them um, off the bat as well. But but we had um, a question from Asiyama, but I think you've answered that, which is what is the impact of the expansion in, in spending? Uh, I think uh, public services spending on productive capacity. So in other words, I guess the question is, why did we not see an impact on growth despite expansionary fiscal policy? And if you have a view on that. Um, the second is a very specific question, Michael, is are you expecting a commodities boom to follow the massive liquidity provision in developed countries, uh, thus lifting South Africa's growth rate exogenously, right? And then let's take a third one, which is a uh, much, uh, much bigger one, but perhaps you could sort of give us your grand vision of how we could change our tax system, our taxation model um, uh, to improve, if you like, the returns to growth. And then there are a few more, but let's just take those three for now. You're on mute, Michael. Very difficult questions. Unfortunately, uh, I missed the first because I was just trying to ask somebody to stop drilling in the office next door. So, so I'll come back to that. But um, is the liquidity provision going to drive commodities? I mean, I, I suppose uh, I would, I mean, there would be a link between, e maybe between easy monetary policy in the, in the global north and gold. Um, but gold is kind of a special commodity, and it's one that is increasingly less significant in South Africa's export basket. If you look at commodity prices over the last uh, um, hundred years, really the kind of way, the, the kind of commodity boom we experienced in the in the two thousands occurs only when you have a rapid process of world historic industrialization as took place in China, which, you know, tr transforms the whole world. And, and you had a similar process of commodity prices in the earlier waves um, that took place with, with the growth of the U.S. and, and, and uh, the, the rollout of electricity and, and roads and things like that, railways. So um, I, don't, I wouldn't see monetary policy playing that kind of fundamental role. It could, I mean, it, it could affect gold. It could have some impact. There is an argument that has been emerging, and I, I know there's a Goldman Sachs uh, report out now saying that the uh, that, that there will be another commodity boom coming. Already, commodity prices, particularly for copper and soybeans and others, have been rising, and for iron ore. And there's an argument that the whole transition to a post-industrial economy that that is the world historic change that is gonna drive an increase in commodity prices because you need copper wires for, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the technology is, but this is the argument, is that as you have a green new deal in the global north and you have this world historic change, this is gonna draw in uh, uh, demand for, for commodities. Maybe if it comes, we should be alert to it, but uh, we shouldn't uh, plan our strategy on the basis that we're gonna be saved by an economic windfall. Um, so uh, let, let's keep an eye on that. The tax system, look, it's going to be very difficult because uh, South Africa has uh, a very high level of taxation already on the affluent middle class. And I would say, so, so and, and the truth is, is that the levels of debt that we've taken on now, uh, there's no question that you are going to have to have tax increases of a significant kind just to cover the interest payments that we are facing. 
In the latest MTBPS, I think Treasury uh, projects that by the outer year, the, in three years' time, we will have 25% of our revenue will be going to pay interest. So, and that's going to keep increasing. So we're going to have to raise taxes. So the, the alternative to raising taxes is, again, putting massive pressure on education, health and policing and the criminal justice system, which is a road to disaster. So we're going to have to raise taxes. I think the structural problem that needs to be resolved is not so much, is the fact that the, the affluent pay tax twice. They pay tax for the poor, provide health, education and security for the poor. They then pay again for themselves, for the private provision of health, education and security. And unless we can overcome that, that segregation between public provision funded out of taxation and private provision, uh, it's a, that's the inefficiency that we need to address in the system. We need to bring those two health systems, education systems and security systems together into one fiscal system. And that's the only way we're going to achieve the efficiencies we, we need in the long run. All right. Thanks, Michael. I mean, to some extent, the first question you missed, but I'll, I'll wrap it into uh, this uh, the sort of following questions is, do you see a path forward to generate growth in a constrained um, and, and to some extent you've answered already, constrained environment where the state's uh, expenditure, investment expenditure is actually very low. So in other words, w where are sources of growth going to come from? That's a rather big question, but do you, if you're constraining state expenditure, given your understanding of historically crowding in, I presume, right, then that crowding in fiscal multiplier, what do we do if that doesn't exist anymore, the crowding in? So that's the first question. The second one um, is around social grants, right? Um, and the question is, you mentioned um, that government took a decision to increase expenditure in favor of the most disadvantaged through social grants. Many studies show that it impacts on the local economy um, positively. Why has this not happened in South Africa? Or is it just that the social grants were not significantly high? I have some views on that, but I'd love to hear yours. Um, then there's a question around the Gini coefficient, where you observed um, that the expansion in the Gini coefficient for those, you know, for top earners, I guess, um, um, putting on your budget hat, the question is, what do you make of the austerity budget in terms of being able to control the deterioration in inequality, I guess, can we use the current austerity budget to actually reduce inequality? And then there's a very um, important question because of the individual's uh, um, affiliation, which is the Budget Justice Coalition. Uh, there's a background to it which you can read, uh, Michael. But the question is, um, aside from the economic arguments, what are the institutional reasons for Treasury and more broadly government's failure to enable course correction, as the NPC is putting it, through a fiscal policy mix that provides the appropriate levels of revenue and expenditure, as well as the right composition of expenditure for our socioeconomic and developmental, developmental needs. Okay, there you go. That's, that's a lot to take you through to the closure. But yeah. let's see. Uh, unfortunately, it's difficult for me to, to follow the chat and, and talk so yeah, much. Yeah, so yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll rely on you. Um, I, I think the the most uh, unhelpful debate we've been having in, in South Africa around fiscal policy centers on something called the multiplier. And, and it's unhelpful because uh, everyone who contributes to that debate seems to think that the, the multiplier is something that actually exists, whereas it is not. Uh, it doesn't actually exist. It is an estimate of how people are going to respond in the future based on how they responded on the past. It is not a thing. It is a statistical artifact. So the question for me is, can you have a very large contraction of expenditure in nominal terms next year, in this 2021, and have, is that, can that be consistent with a rebound, a recovery in economic growth? Treasury in the medium term budget policy statement says, yes, it is possible. And they have a, a, a strong reason for that because their, 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 their forecast says that there will be a large rebound in household consumption expenditure. So 
So we've all been in a lockdown. We've been like uh, frustrated because we can't go to the bar. And as soon as we lift the lockdown and unleash alcohol consumption, there will be this huge, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trivializing it a little bit, but there will be a rebound in consumption expenditure. And this rebound will be more than sufficient to offset the, the fiscal contraction for one year in 2021. And then in the following year, there's going to be a rebound in private, ex private investment expenditure. And that is going to sustain the rebound even as the fiscal consolidation uh, uh, continues. Now, the question is, is that, that that might happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But, but are you convinced by that argument rather than uh, the multiplier is X, therefore? Um, uh, because these are dynamics that change with, with conditions. So I think it's going to be extreme. I don't, I, I, I'm not convinced. I think that... If we're going to have a recovery next year, it's going to be almost impossible to have a, a real recovery in the face of a massive fiscal contraction next year. That's my view. And I, I, um, we, we, that doesn't mean we need to abandon the fiscal challenge that we face, but it means that uh, in all likelihood, we will end up uh, continuing to slide on our fiscal metrics because... Um, yeah. So, so I think the only way that, that unfortunately uh, for me, for others, it might not be unfortunate, but unfortunately for me, I'm now convinced that the, the only way you can revive the pace of economic growth in South Africa is through private investment. That there is not a public infrastructure in less investment led growth path. Uh, that is the, the only thing that what, once we have revived private investment, we can uh, talk about uh, bolstering. And, and if we do revive private investment in a significant way, we will be able to sustain a fiscal uh, slippage beyond what we currently are able to do. So for me, the key is private investment. How do you do that? That unfortunately in the short run, uh, again, unfortunately for me and unfortunately for the ANC means uh, some degree of liberalizing markets, opening space, where private investors can come in and, and make money, uh, whether it's in broadband, whether it's in tourism, whether it's in energy. We, we, without that, I don't see a, a new path of growth because this is a, it's, it's more than, so, so maybe to go back to, to an argument I was making before, we, we've been growing at average. And now since about 2016, we've been growing far below average. And so, so my view is that we can revive the pace of growth. That doesn't necessarily mean having uh, a 6% growth rate, 10% becoming China. But now, essentially, uh, our per capita income has been falling for the last 10 years. So restoring a momentum of growth around 2% is doable. And if we don't do that, we're dead in the water. And, but the only way it's really doable is by reviving private investment, by making compromises with big corporate capital in South Africa. And I think that's the position we've arrived at. The, the uh, social grants, I, I would say, I, I mean, I think they have contributed massively to demand. And uh, they have led to a boom in, in uh, they have contributed to a boom and an improvement in, in uh, economic performance but in areas that are outside of the uh, uh, core, the, the, the kind of enclave of the bubble of, uh, of South African corporate growth. So if you go to former Bantustan areas and, and the peripheries around there, there's been huge booms in, in, uh, in, in activity, but that doesn't generate into tax revenue. So uh, th th there's a broader problem. And I think, you know, uh, I, I have, I'm not a supporter of a basic income grant for, for reasons I won't go into now. Uh, but I think um, w w one of my big concerns now is that the, the, the potential for the basic income grant debate to eclipse the very necessary improvements in resource allocation we need in health, education and public housing. Uh, because that, to me, is the path that is a much more uh, dependable path uh, of growth. The Gini coefficient. I was talking in particular. I, I 
I should have been clearer, efficient. I was talking in particular by uh, labor market earnings. That there's evidence, there's a paper that I've looked at which which shows a, a jump in the Gini coefficient in labor market earnings. Now remember that a lot of the Gini coefficient is the difference between capital and labor. But I'm just talking within that labor because the labor is what is driving the personal income tax collection. So I'm saying that the, 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 there's evidence of a sharp increase in the Gini coefficient, which indicates, uh, as I was saying, that the affluent continued earning uh, even as the rest of the economy was decelerating. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, and you stayed within time, which is uh, very unusual for a former bureaucrat. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much to, um, to actually lift off uh, Michael's presentation. I know that we will uh, make his presentation available. Um, and for those of you who are interested in more detailed reading, Michael does have a working paper available through uh, Wits University Center for Inequality Studies, where he's a professor there. Um, so I just want to thank uh, everybody. Um, and just a reminder before I hand over to Ray, that because, as is quite obvious, the rich presentation, Michael has given raises so many other questions. We take one of them into the second part, uh, which is this time next week uh, of the seminar series around revenue management. And we've got Professor Dennis Davis, uh, as well as Mr. Ivan Pillay, talking about SARS, very much about how to how to maximize revenue through SARS. And I think that'll be an interesting uh, seminar as well. So with that, let me close off uh, our seminar here and thank Michael again. Uh, um, uh, greatly for, for giving us his time and his ideas and his skill set uh, for the hour um, and um, uh, look forward to seeing you next week this time. Um, let me just hand over to Ray. Yeah, uh, thank you very much Arun and Michael. I think we all agree that was a fantastic presentation and a great deal of work went into that and I think on behalf of ourselves and the Conrad Adenauer uh, Stiftung Thank you very much for the effort. It was, it was fantastic. I think we can all agree that our brains are now working in 2021 and January mist has lifted. And again, please tune in next week. We have, uh, we have Judge Dennis Davis and Ivan Pele, two fantastic uh, contributors on revenue taxation. And uh, see you next week, 11 o'clock at the same time. Thank you.